Well, hello everyone and welcome. Today I want to ask the second question that I normally ask in my classroom and hopefully do a short version of it. And that is, what is mathematics? The first question I asked is, why are you here? And I've got a short version video for that. And the second question I ask is, what is mathematics? So let's jump right in. <clears throat> so on the board, usually in my classroom, I've got three basic questions. Uh, the first one is, what is real? The second one is, how do we know? Meaning, how do we know these things that we say that we know? How do we justify knowledge? And then the third one would be then, um, how should we live? How do we know gets into then the question of what is mathematics? So, uh, there's some debate about this. I don't claim to have all the answers. This is my current level of understanding. Um, but there's three basic ways of knowing. Um, experience, intuition, and reason. Mathematics is going to be over here in the reason category, but let's talk about experience and intuition first. Um, experience might be the most simplest thing, like you, you know because you've experienced it, like right, so fire is hot, um, the sky is blue, things like that. So for experience, this would be something maybe that's personal. You know it because you've experienced it yourself. It may be historical. You've got some record of that um, somehow. Um, it also may be scientific. And um, so perhaps the, the most important thing about um, knowing through experience is the experiment. It was Galileo that kind of wrested the, uh, the concept of an experiment um, and added to the thought that Aristotle had. Aristotle thought if he just sat around and philosophized about how things moved on the physical earth and science and things like that, he could figure everything out. And if it made sense in his own mind, uh, that's how it was. Galileo said, no, you've got to experiment. Because sometimes the truth of the physical universe is far different from the way that we would have imagined it to be. And so experience really is kind of, it's the physical world. Um, So this is primarily dealt with through maybe even the body, the five senses, okay? Um, it also is, it's logic in a sense, it's inductive logic going from the particulars to the general um, as opposed to something else. But uh, yeah, experience. Um, intuition, I'll, I'll step over that for a moment. But reason then has to do with the mind. If experience has to do with the body, reason has to do with the mind. Um, reason would be deductive logic. Starting from general truths, can we get specific stuff? Um, and if you've never taken a logic class, I would strongly encourage you to take a logic class. It sh everybody that graduates from basic high school should be required to take a basic logic class. And I don't mean like a mathematic or a symbolic logic class. I mean like a Socratic logic class. If you have the chance to take one, definitely take it. But then mathematics is a subset of this. Mathematics is a branch of deductive logic. And of course, the tool of mathematics then is the proof. If somebody says prove it, they're asking for a mathematical um, argument for it or a reason for it, as opposed to an experiment. Um, and intuition, I'm, I'm not even sure I like the phrase intuition. This middle thing in here is kind of, um, loose in terms of its definition or things like that. But I would say intuition would be things like feelings, um, conscience. Um, it gets into things of taking somebody's word for it. So it would be like authority or even like history. So some of these kind of branch off of this. Some of, some of these kind of mix up over here and some of these kind of mix up over there. And so, you know, reason and so forth comes over here with also an experiment and so forth. So there's, there's some combinations that exist there. The, the real thing about intuition would be then trust. Um, do you tr if, you're, if you haven't experienced it yourself, do you trust a person that's telling you something? 
Um, and so there's different ways that, that you can go on there. Um, <laughs> one of the questions, maybe you've heard me ask this before, but I asked this in class and kids always like, they don't know what to do with it. But um, I asked the question, um, is it wrong to punch a baby in the face? And the kids just are out, like outrageous. They laugh. They, they don't know what to do. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not in any way saying it's not wrong to punch a baby in the face. I believe that it is, most definitely. But why is it wrong to punch a baby in the face? Wow. Which one of these ways of knowing are you going to use to provide a reason why it's wrong? And please understand. Oh, yes, it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. Are you going to use a proof? Give me a mathematical proof as to why it's wrong. <laughs> Give me an, um, an experiment that shows why it's wrong. No, an experiment doesn't show you why something is. It just shows you that something is. Um, and so there, there's different ways then of knowing. And so which method you use needs to be appropriate to the type of knowing that you're doing. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Blaise Pascal in his um, new experiments concerning the vacuum. U U, I think is that he spelled vacuum with, with two U's. Um, in his introduction, he does a fantastic job of sorting out where you would use reason over here and where you would use authority over here. And so, he's, and keep in mind, this is in like the 1600s and it's, it's very much kind of a Roman Catholic church um, dominated period. And so he's got to be careful and say, well, you know, we're going to disagree. I'm going to disagree with Aristotle about the, the existence of a vacuum, but I'm not in any way like contradicting him in a sense of his authority because this is you, you you know things by authority over here in this area and you know things by experiment over here in this area and we shouldn't like confuse the two it's wonderful everybody that's in any kind of a high school science class should read it it's very good but anyway um mathematics though comes from the way of reason uh, the method of reason so now let's talk real quickly about logic and i mean deductive logic so the three acts of the mind the first act that the mind does is it understands um, things. Most, uh, it understands terms. Are the terms clear or not clear? If I said red, what do I mean? Do I mean the color? Do I mean the past tense of read? Or do I mean some colloquialism like, you know, um, communist or something like that? The first thing our mind does is it understands the terms or doesn't understand, but understanding is the first act of the mind. The, the next act of the mind, number two, is judgment. Once we understand the terms, we can then make statements about the terms, like the sky is blue. And our mind is deciding, well, is that a true statement or is that a false statement? So that's what I mean when I say judgment. We, we judge the propositions the declarative statements. And then the third act of the mind then is actual logical reasoning. Um, is the argument valid or invalid? Okay, and I've done a video on this. I probably need to redo it because the one I did previously is old, but there's a video on Marshable Math about the three acts of the mind. You should go watch it. It's very good. That came from Peter Kreef's book, um, Socratic Logic. It's in this book right there on the show. So, um, now, let's talk about um, a valid argument. So an, an argument then is giving a reason why the conclusion must be true. So here's a valid argument. All men are mortal. Uh, the second statement, then Socrates is a man, and then there's a line, and then I'm going to draw my little symbol right there. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Okay, that's a valid argument. There's different forms of arguments that are valid, and then, then there's some common ones that are invalid that people think that they're valid, but they're really not. And so if you take a logic class, you'll sort that out. The first thing we need to do is uh, make sure that we understand the terms. When it says all men are mortal, does that mean just males as opposed to females? And the answer is no. In this case, men is in the anthropomorphic sense, humans. Okay, mortal, which means like you're gonna die, right? Do I understand the term Socrates is a man? Okay, I think I understand those terms. And both of those statements are true. All, all people, all humans are mortal. And then Socrates was a human being. And therefore, that's what these three little dots mean. 
Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Um, the conclusion must be true. You may say, I don't like how that makes me feel. Well, that's not logic, right? That's, that's something else. It doesn't matter how you feel about it, and it doesn't matter um, whether it strikes you like superficially is true or not. If all the um, propositions are clear, and all, I'm sorry, all the propositions are true, all the terms are clear, and the argument's valid, you have to accept the conclusion, okay? It's necessary. Socrates must be mortal. Why? Well, because of these things here. So, um, an argument tells why something is true, why it must be true, why it's necessary that it be true. It's the because. Uh, here's an invalid argument. Grass is green, the sky is blue. Therefore, pigs cannot fly. <laughs> here's the thing. All of those are true statements. Grass is green, um, generally speaking, if it's alive and so forth. The sky is blue. Yeah, generally speaking, the sky is blue. Um, we might debate particulars or so forth, but in general, yeah, the sky is blue. Um, pigs cannot fly. Yeah, generally speaking, pigs cannot fly unless you somehow, like, you know, attach wings to them or something like that and, and then go. But why cannot pigs fly? Well, it's got nothing to do with the grass being green or the sky is blue. So the, the terms, I think, are clear. The propositions are true. The conclusion is a true statement. But the reason why is totally false, right? The pigs can't fly, not because the grass is green and the sky is blue. It's got to do with the nature of pigs, okay? So that's an invalid argument. So therefore then means because of what was stated previously, something must be true, okay? Now, mathematics then is an argument. It's the why. Why is something true? Mathematics is not merely a true statement. Mathematics is why the statement must be true. And so that's why in a math class, if you've got a good mathematics teacher, um, at least in, in the higher mathematics, not just accounting, right? Um, th the math teacher makes you show your work, okay? And I get into debates all the time with students who I will look at their, their algebra or so forth and I will say, you're missing mathematical methods. And they will say, but is the answer right? And I'm like, I'm, I'm not interested in that, really. The answer may very well be right, but how do you know it's right? This is back to the question of how do you know? Mathematics is not the conclusion. Mathematics is the argument that makes the conclusion necessary. It must be true. Okay, so um, show your work if you're doing mathematics. Mathematics is not the answer. Mathematics is the method that demonstrates why the answer must be the answer. Okay, so now if you want to reject a conclusion, your terms are not clear. Or your propositions are not true. Or your argument is not valid. Okay, and that's why mathematics is useful then for all people to study because it requires precision with variables, right? Remember, I, I've told you if you've been a student of mine, we only use x for a variable and it, and it can, you don't use it for multiplication symbols in algebra and it can only represent one thing. You can't have multiple x's in a problem that mean multiple different things. Once you pick an x for something, it is that something, okay? Whatever it is, it permanently is. And then if you want to talk about something else, you have to use a different variable, right? So that's making the terms clear. The propositions have to be true. Like if you've made a, a math error and, you know, added seven to both sides of an equation or something and you made a computation mistake, well, then your mathematics is bad because you're, you've made a statement that's false. You've said something, something, something is equal to something that is not. And then um, the argument then is your mathematical process whereby you show, starting from the beginning, the conclusion must be true, okay? So um, mathematics then is a branch of deductive logic. So mathematics does this. It yields certainty. So, oops, sorry about my whys. I have trouble with my whys. I'm impatient. Certainty. 
the truths of math are certain truths. There may be certain, there may be truth in some other areas, like, I don't know, history or ethics or politics or something like that, but we're much less certain about those sorts of things, okay? And the truths of mathematics can be demonstrated. And these are perhaps the two particular things that set mathematics apart from other disciplines. How can we be certain that the truths of math are true? Because you can show them using the rules of deductive mathematical logic. Um, and so again, the conclusion is the answer and the argument is the mathematics. So if you give me an answer as a student, I want to show that you've demonstrated that that's the correct answer. All right. so. Um, I've read a number of these authors, and I just want to share you some brief thoughts about mathematics from some of them. All right, so Nick, uh, Nicomachus, or Nicomachus, however you pronounce his number, um, his name. Um, introduction to Arithmetic. It's about 100 AD, and he's the one that kind of sorts out, or at least records, the sorting out of what mathematics tells us. What, is, what do numbers tell us? Um, he says uh, things then, both properly so-called and those that simply have the name, are some of them unified and continuous. For example, an animal, that's one thing. The universe, that's one thing. A tree and the like, which are properly and particularly called magnitudes. Here's a key idea. Numbers tell us how big something is. How big is one thing? Okay. Others are discontinuous in a side-by-side -side arrangement and, as it were, in heaps, which are called multitudes. Here's the other sort of a thing. A flock, for instance, a people, a heap, a chorus, and the like. This has to do with one thing, that's a magnitude, or many things. Numbers tell us how big one thing is, or it tells us how many a group is. It tells us size or it tells us quantity. And we can get into some things like um, continuous things or discrete things. A continuous thing can be continually divided, cut it in half like a stick, like okay, divided in half and then divided in half again and then divided in half. But if you're taking a group of things, they can be continuously multiplied. Like, I'm going to add to it, and I'm going to add to it, and I'm going to add to it, and I'm going to add to it. So um, there's even a, a pretty strong philosophical uh, discussion involving this idea of one and many, right? What's the, what's the motto of the United States? Isn't it e pluribus unum? Out of many people, one nation? Because we're not just made up of different ethnic groups that, you know, uh, either mix or don't mix, but we're made up of people that have a similar... Um, sense of ideas and values, and so we can take many different cultures and have one nation. That's, that's unique. Um, so anyway, Nicomachus, these two different things, magnitudes and multitudes, and he goes on farther and even explains what they are. And if you've um, seen the poster that I made here behind me on the seven liberal arts, there's three of them that are language-based, and then there's four of them that are mathematics-based, and these four then, Nicomachus, Describes. He says, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy, those are the four mathematical arts called the quadrivium. And he lists them in this order and explains why arithmetic has to come first and music and geometry and astronomy and so forth. And the definitions that I've got here I took right out of Nicomachus's writings. Okay. Now, why would you need to study mathematics? He, he, in his book, um, Introduction Then to Arithmetic, he says why you should study these things. You would think it's for job skills. And he quotes Plato, who's having an argument with somebody. And um, in the argument um, between, no, it's not Plato, it's one of the dialogues of Plato, but he's quoting Socrates. And Socrates is debating with somebody about why you should study things. And this guy that's debating with Socrates says, oh, you should study arithmetic because it helps you count things like grain or you know, armies or whatever. And music would help you with festivals and geometry helps you lay out cities and to like wage war with, you know, different, you know, spatial moves. And then astronomy tells you how to manage the calendar and things like this. So he's listing all of these things that are perhaps useful, right? And um, here's what he says, starting right here. Socrates reproaching him says, you amuse me. In other words, you, you make me laugh because you fear that, seem to fear that these are useless studies that I recommend, the, the four mathematical arts. 
But that's very difficult, impossible. For the eye of the soul, blinded and buried by other pursuits, is rekindled and aroused again by these. By what? By the four mathematical arts. And these alone, it's better that this be saved than thousands of bodily eyes. For by it alone, the eye of your soul, is the truth of the universe beheld. <gasps> what? Socrates says that studying things for vocation, whoops, that's supposed to be a V, vocation for their use is bad. I'm not sure I agree with him that studying mathematics for its usefulness is bad in that sense. But he's saying there's something more important. You should study mathematics for its formation. Socrates says the eye of your soul, which is distracted and blinded by other things that are really like less, less important, um, is awakened again uh, by the mathematical arts. When you study math for mathematics purposes, the, the, like abstract pure math, um, it awakens the eye of your soul. And it's the eye of your soul that sees the beauty and truth of the universe. And that it's better that you be able to see with this eye than you be physically be able to see, right? Better that this be saved than thousands of bodily eyes. If I were to ask you, which would you rather be? Able to physically see with your eyes um, or be blind and yet understand uh, the truths of the universe by studying mathematics in your mind? Which, which would you rather take? Socrates says it's better to be physically blind and understand the beauty and truth of the universe through mathematics. You can think about that. But um, I hope you can have both. Claudius Ptolemy, about the same time, in his book, The Almagest, which means the greatest. This was the biggest book of mathematics of the ancient world, um, about in 100 AD. Um, and if you know the Greek philosophy at this time, it was that the physical world was down below and was imperfect. And then you had the divine world up above, the, the idea of the forms, the perfect things. Um, and so uh, the physical world was filled with things that decayed and rotted and changed and so forth. And so that's imperfect. But the divine world up above where the stars and the planets and things like that were, and above them, that's where the, the, the true existence was, the, the, uh, the, the permanent things, the perfect things. I gotta wrap this up, it's taking too long, but you get me talking on something I like and I just, I just get going. Um, Ptolemy says, um, we first have our introduction to mathematics in the physical world. So you've got mathematics down in the physical world, like you count ducks or like how many apples or like you cut an apple in half, that's fractions. Right? You learn first about uh, mathematics through the physical world, but mathematics, are also seen in the perfect world, abstract math, without having to have physical things uh, to understand the principles. And so mathematics then lifts your mind up from the physical world to the more divine truths. And so only after somebody has studied mathematics are they then really truly able to talk about things like justice, truth, beauty, um, nobility, and so forth, these things that are have, have divine implications. And so he says, indeed, there's a quote, this same discipline that would be mathematics would more than any other prepare understanding persons with respect to nobleness of actions and character by means of the sameness, good order, and due proportion and simple directness contemplated in divine things, making its followers lovers of that divine beauty and making habitual in them, and as it were natural, a light condition of the soul. And he says, after you come to learn mathematics in a divine sense, in the perfect sense, it then comes back down and it, it helps you be a better person in the physical world because of your understanding of these perfect relationships and truths in the divine world. Interesting. Rene Descartes. Um, discourse on the method, which is about the, the mid 1600s. Um, and this is Rene Descartes, probably the father of modern um, philosophy in the modern world. And he, he kicks off kind of this movement. Um, here's what he says He says, Most of all, I was delighted with mathematics because of the certainty, there it is again, of its demonstrations and the evidence of his reasoning. But I did not yet understand its true use in believing it was of service only in the mechanical arts. You can only do stuff in like physics with it. I was astonished that, seeing how firm and solid was its basis, no loftier edifice had been reared thereupon. 
He said, mathematics gives such certain truth and is so sure a way of knowing, why haven't we built other things on top of it? And so he's going to develop this thing that he calls the method, where he's going to try to use mathematics or mathematical principles to discover all truth. And that's his book that he wrote, Discourse on Method. Um, I probably should do a video series on that. It's, it's very, very good. Um, but here's what he says. He says, but like one who walks alone in the twilight, I resolved to go slowly. Um, do you much circumspection in all things? Um, he's going to go slow, and he's going to say this. Um, he's going to talk about reason. Notice the capital R there. And he's going to seek the true method. Notice the capital M, his mathematical method of all the things which his mind was capable. Okay, and here he goes. Here's the method he's going to build off of. Among the different branches of philosophy, I had in my younger days, to a certain extent, studied logic, and those of mathematics, geometrical analysis, and algebra. And so he's going to merge kind of those three together to make his new method. And so then that's kind of what kicks off, I don't know, this, this, um, this journey we've been on in understanding how mathematics then applies to um, all sorts of different things. And so the question is, can mathematics discover all truth? Well, that's the debate. I mean, you're, you might have known Rene Descartes for his statement, I think, therefore, I am, and um, did you know that that was his first step in a mathematical proof for the existence of God? You should read it. it it's, it's compelling. Anyway, so getting back now to what is mathematics. What is real? Is the physical world all that there is? Well, is mathematics a physical thing? I would say no. Mathematics is not only a physical thing. You can see it in physical things, but it itself is not physical. Um, is mathematics real? Uh, yes. Okay. Maybe even more real, perhaps, than the physical things, like the table that's here, or the computer, or the video screen that you're using to watch this. Um, Ptolemy says it's perfect and unchanging. Therefore, it's, it is more real than the things in the physical world. Why is it possible that my mind has access to this kind of knowledge, and so does yours, and we can debate about them and, and understand the rules of, by which this thing operates, and we both have access to that? How is my mind somehow connected to your mind? That's like, that's really strange and curious. Um, what is mathematics? Is it something that humans create, or is it something that's, that's beyond us, that transcends human beings individually. Um, so if, if you believe in a creator, then that answer is actually more easier answered than, um, that question is more easily answered than other uh, types of questions or other people with belief systems. Um, if you believe in a creator, therefore the world is created by a divine mind, Um, and human beings are created in that same image that we have somehow access to that divine mind, then what you're studying when you study mathematics is the nature of God himself. And that was kind of what Descartes was getting at with his I think, therefore I am statement. It's like I understand I've got access now to some part of the divine mind. And so when you study it, you're studying God's thoughts um, after him. Um, if you don't believe in a creator, you've got a much more difficult kind of um, question to answer. What is it? Some people now even debate that mathematics is objectively real. Um, a couple of years ago, I was over at Rollins College, um, and I was talking to the physics department folks there, and they were saying that they no longer let the mathematics department at Rollins College teach the physics students their mathematics, because the philosophy of the mathematics department is that mathematics is just an illusion. It's not really real, because um, how could it be? It's just the universe is just chaos and randomness and so forth. And so mathematics, therefore, doesn't really apply to anything, you know, in the physical world. And the physicists are like, you're destroying our entire science. That's the whole basis upon which we build our science, is that mathematics can describe, order, and predict the behavior of the physical universe. So they would teach their physics students mathematics in the physics department because of the philosophy of math. You realize that there's math fights throughout history. 
Um, people don't always agree on what math, math, mathematics is or how to do mathematics. So this is an interesting discussion. But uh, what is mathematics? Let me leave you with this. It is a branch of human logic or reason. And um, mathematics is the method that yields a certain conclusion, okay? Mathematics has to deal with the mind. All right, so um, here we go, back to me. What is mathematics? Well, it's a branch of human reason, involves the activity of the mind, it's based upon logic, and mathematical methods then yield a certain conclusion. Um, and the argument is the mathematics, not just the conclusion. So make sure that if you're going to be doing mathematics that you have an argument there. Particularly geometry teaches you to do um, good arguments. So um, it's worthy for everybody to study, not just people who are going to use it in their career, right? Um, uh, you have a soul. I like that eye of your soul to become awakened and be aware of the truths of the universe. And Socrates says that's better to be saved than thousands of bodily eyes. It's worth studying for everybody. So anyway, um, have a great day and continue to pursue the good, the true, and the beautiful. Bye-bye.